Inside the Triangle, the Decker Truck Line Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside the Triangle. I am your host, Darren Ladley, and today we have a extraordinary guest. I do believe this requires a little bit of a intro. Matt Lynch, Director of <laughs> Fleet Maintenance. I believe that's your title, isn't it? Uh, Director of Maintenance Operations. Maintenance Operations, okay. Matt, how long have you been here now? 15 years. 50, Jesus, God. You sure it's been 15 years? Wow. Got the, got the certificate. You got the certificate, the, the little fancy <laughs> piece of paper on your wall? Yeah, because yeah. now you only get them. First, you got them every year, and then it went to every, like, five years or something like that. So, so what? Uh, well, when you first started here, you were just the body shop, uh, manager of the body shop, correct? No, when I started, I was just the body shop tech. Body shop tech, okay. So, Monty was your... I got hired on. Jeff Galgley ended up being my direct supervisor. Okay. Um, Monty was, like... A supervisor of the body shop but i was more sale equipment okay i was hired to kind of basically still fulfill our duties that we were doing at cars decker was my largest customer when i came over for about three years they were my largest customer for what what did you have a car i'm not sure i don't remember what was that cars was conky auto restoration so we we sandblasted and painted trailers for sale um we painted the truck frames Anything for the day cabs. Because you were in the, what, well, I don't know, that building just outside of, t- outside of the office here. Weren't you guys out there for, uh, I think it became a landscaping place. And, and I, I think it sits empty now. So Yeah, I think FedEx uh, guy owns one half of it and the other side's up for sale. So how'd you get your start in auto body? <laughs> um, broke my arm in a motorcycle crash. <laughs> what is it with the body shop? You, you, Tyson, Feely, I mean, you guys all have death witches when it comes to motorcycles? Yeah. Was it a dirt bike or a crotch rocket or what was it? No, it was a 1980 KZ something. I don't remember. 550 LTD. Okay. So, something, yeah, you don't even want to talk about something that bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you broke your arm and you ended up having to go to body shop school? No, I never did go. I was in college for business management. Mm-hmm. Um, I just had to sell the bike. I had to fix it. So uh, nobody wants to buy a crumpled up piece of junk. So I ended up having to go through and repair it and basically repaint it and everything else. So it just, I started in the shop over there on the side, just owner was friends with my mom and uh, allowed me to do it at my own time whenever I could use some materials. And after I got done with that, he said, uh, Hey, would you mind working for me? And, it was about the time that pay less cashways was kind of going downhill, so I wasn't getting very many hours. So I went ahead and signed on, and I started sandblasting. Just kind of worked up from there, built up the, from the bottom to the top over at his place. I think I was uh, my job title was general manager when I left. So then you came over here, and so you started working in the body shop doing that. So what nowadays? What is your daily? What kind of or do you oversee now? I know it's a long list, but yeah. I mean, what's generally, what do you, what's your job duties? Anything that needs to get done. <laughs> Anything that needs to get done. I mean, it, trying to follow up with the shop personnel looking over, I still directly oversee the body shop here, looking over their work orders, um, trying to schedule stuff in for there, still overseeing some of the stuff that's going into over the road shops, connecting invoices, working with the shops. Well, you kind of watch over the Fort Dodge shop, both tractor and trailer, Mm -hmm. Um, the body shop, the truck wash, I believe also, you got the prep building, you know, you're overseeing them. Um, Do you also oversee uh, some of the outside terminals too, like Birmingham and and, uh, Hammond and those? Yeah. So uh, we just opened a new shop down in Des Moines. We actually have now, how many mechanics have we got on down there now? I just saw a new one just get hired uh, today or this week. So should put us probably about six or seven down there. Yeah. Okay. Not enough for a second shift yet though, right? Or have we started? Not yet. What's the ultimate goal down there? I mean, logistically going to be a shop over in that area that would make more sense for flatbed and reefer. Take some of the burden off Fort Dodge. Obviously, we smaller population. It's harder to find help sometimes in this area. We have the... The college and everything else that is training up all these techs, but all these techs are going back home after they either go on summer or they graduate. And so it was easier to pull a lot of techs pretty quick in that Des Moines market. 
Basically, I mean, we're trying to make sure that we have terminals where it makes sense to be able to get drivers in and out. Well, 80 and 35 is a main corridor. I mean, we, we, I don't know how many times the trucks are going through the reef or flatbed, all of them are zigzagging through Des Moines all the time. It only mm-hmm. makes sense. You got the north, south, east, west, so they're all covered. Mm-hmm. Plus, I mean, guys, if you look at how many trucks, and I know are a lot of our drivers, you'd be in Des Moines, oh, got to get something done in the truck. You got to drive all the way up here to Fort Dodge to get something done that you could have just had done down in Des Moines. And that's a waste of time, fuel, money, driver's time, and their money. So it just makes more sense to have it there. Mm-hmm. The Davenport shop. Now, I mean, it was a decent location, but we never got the traffic through there. I don't think we counted on, did we? No. Yeah. And that was a big part of it is the fuel island broke down that terminal was plagued with a lot of power outages and the last power outage we had in one of the storms took out the fuel island to repair that fuel island was huge money so when you start routing everybody down the road to get fuel they're not coming back to the davenport terminal for anything else so a lot of the drivers were coming back to fort dodge um, out routing to fort dodge to get repairs or they'd try to get into Hammond and stuff like that. So a lot of times the Davenport terminal was getting bypassed. Yeah, the power outages that that terminal suffered. I don't know why, because it was just sitting in between two out of just outside of Davenport. But I mean, I, I remember when we first took over that terminal down there. I mean, every time you turn around, they were down. I mean, it was just Storm Central or something in that area there. Yeah, and it was right by a power grid, like a power station too. So it was weird that we lost power as much as we did, but it definitely, we are we had a generator ready if just in case that we were going to keep the terminal any longer we were planning on getting just addressing that part of it because they did lose power so much they were running off a service truck all the time (laughs) well i don't know if you were here back you know before we had that terminal do you remember where our terminal was before that no i wasn't here for that oh you weren't here for that so you know where that camper dealership is when you get off at walcott when you get off now at walcott at the truck stop Okay, you have the camper dealership on the south side of the road. Mm -hmm. Well, originally that was a Union 76 truck stop. And then when Union 76 closed down, then it became Umtham got it. And then when Umtham got it, then we ended up, that was our terminal at first when we first were down in that area. Then we bought that one over there. Okay. Well, it was just like the Hammond terminal. You know, Hammond's a nice terminal. We did a really nice addition onto that terminal probably 10 years ago, maybe something like that, eight years ago. That was a nice, because when we first had it, you couldn't get, a truck and a trailer into that thing it was one two trucks and that was about it this is a lot better location than that one was so hammond having the paved parking lot it is a nice terminal it's a little small you can tell that aldam owned it i think believe before us mm-hmm. they have diesel fired heaters and stuff like that <laughs> for the floor and whatnot it was i think all in to make sure that they didn't have like an open flame or something but and we run just one shift out of Hammond, I believe it is, correct? Yep. How many mechanics are we running out of there? We just got a fourth. A fourth one? Okay. Um, Bessemer. So Bessemer is another fairly newer terminal of ours, probably within the last 10 years. Um, We were at another location at Dang, a tornado took out. Yeah, tornado <laughs> took out that one. Yep. Yeah. Um, in fact, I almost had tornado take out this one here a few years ago. It got a competitor of ours, Boyd Brothers. Um, and we've really, we've gone to a second shift, I believe, down there at Bessemer, are we not? Yeah, we're actually gearing up to try to get uh, weekends also. Wow, that'd be awesome. So I just actually just saw some praise. It was up on uh, Facebook here. I think it was last night. Peter Belk, I believe it was, said he, every, all the drivers said, go to Bessemer, go to Bessemer. They're good. They're great. And he replied back. He says, wow. He says, you weren't kidding. He said, I went in there. Those guys worked extra hard. They said, you will get out of here tonight. And I mean, he couldn't have praised him any harder than he did. I mean, it was awesome. Kyle and his guys are, they're doing a good job. You can see it. Uh, they, they joke with the drivers, they hang out with the drivers, they work hard for the drivers. So it's yes. that whole staff's doing a lot of good things. And then Missoula. Well, we can't. It's Jason's out there. So, I mean, you can't say anything good about Missoula, right? No, none. <laughs> none. <laughs> what, what kind of hours and how many mechanics we got working out there? Um, I believe that we have three. And if you ever want to know how to throw tire chains, Liam is the guy that can teach you how to throw tire chains for in the wintertime. I don't know if you knew that. They built that thing out there. That guy, he can throw them on faster than anybody I've ever seen in my life. So, guys, you want to learn how, go see Liam. I think we even made some or Liam made some videos as well. Did he? Because he, he has that machine that he did 
we were using it to show the difference in sounds for a stuck break and a, a freed up break. Oh yeah. Okay. I remember. All right. So the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was shops we've covered. What about, we got new trucks coming. We've got a total of about 300 new trucks coming. Over 300. Yeah. Over 300. Um, I know I wanted to update guys cause it's not going quite as smooth as we were hoping. Not us. No, not our part. Not, not our part. So what's going on? COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't see the immediate effect. I mean, all the warehouses stock up on parts and everything else. Um, so, I mean, everything just taking its toll. You have container ships that are sitting out in the ocean that aren't getting unloaded. So, And you have OEs. Uh, Volvo talked to them the other day. They're exploring other options for warranty. What do you mean by exploring other options? That because part shortages. Mm, okay. Uh, Cummins is doing the same. They just, we were struggling to get parts in, but it affects the truck line as well when they're assembling all these trucks. I think Ford posted the other day that they had like 55,000 cars that they were struggling because of computer chips. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an ongoing issue. It's luckily we have contacts very high up and to try to source parts. We seen a dealer that said that i think we had a turbo go out and there was another truck there that, that had a turbo that was bad as well the dealership told us that it was going to be at least a month because they already checked on that guy and he was an owner op or something just broke down he was waiting that long we had the turbo within a day but the numbers of that turbo secretly hidden <laughs> somewhere is dwindling pretty fast so there's all sorts of different reasons as well. I think that labor shortages, um, a lot of people laid off for COVID. That's affected the output. So, Well, I, I was reading in the transport topic here. It's probably still sitting on my desk. Volvo, Peterbilt, a lot of these, they're, and not just because of, of personnel, but because of, like you said, parts. They can't get the parts uh, in to do anything. They're shutting their plants down, and they're running like a week on, a week off, a week on, a week off, and that's slowing down production too. I know there's car dealerships doing it. There's a lot of them. A friend of mine uh, owns a Toro dealership here in town, and we were out to eat last night, and he says he can't get lawnmowers. He said because they got 50,000 of them on the conveyor belt that they're waiting for a part for that they can't do anything with because they're waiting on a part, and who knows when it's going to get here. So he can't get lawnmowers to sell. Yeah, it's that that container ship that <laughs> the Suez Canal, you know, that <laughs> blocked everything up for God knows how long. So, so the equipment where we originally want, we're hoping if I remember right, 11, 11 a week for the first couple of months, or was it six a week for the first couple of months? And then it was going to ramp up. Oh, I'm pretty sure it was, we were looking at getting 11, 11 a week. And I'm going to be honest guys. I mean, it's got us backed up big time. We always have like a large year and then the next year it winds down. So mm -hmm. then the following year it, cleans up so we always have that unbalance in our ordering but didn't help that our three our big year hit during the covid deal right now is not helping the situation at all yeah it, no it didn't help any yeah the 18 model year has been a model year that we're trying to focus on getting moved out i mean the, the mx engine a lot of drivers like the power mm -hmm. um they like the feel of them they uh they get good fuel mileage but We've just found with that 18 that there's some engines out there that have a little bit of an issue. A design flaw or something like that, that. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, I ran into some guy. In fact, I just talked to one of my lease purchase guys today, and uh, he's in a 17, and he's excited. He says he's got 572,000 miles on it, and it's going to be paid for in probably about eight months. And he's excited. And I said, well, I said, you know what? I think uh, I'd probably be looking at trading that thing in when you, as soon as you get it paid for. And he said, yeah, really? And I said, what, what motor? Is it red or black? And he said, black. I said, yeah, let's get that thing traded in as soon as you get it paid for. How many trailers have we got coming this year? Oh, what did Mal say? He just said it the other, it was over 100. 100 reefer trailers or 100 total reefer and flatbed? It was reefer. Reefer, okay. And I do believe all the new trailers are analog brakes? Disc. Disc brakes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. disc brakes, okay. And, and a driver brought up a good point the other day, and, and I believe all the new trucks are going to be front disc or disc all the way around? The disc all the way around. Disc all the way around. Because one guy says he really, really, really wants those disc brakes all the way around. And I know we, we had some for a little while. On and the steer axle. On the steer axle. And they perform a lot better than, than the drum does. So I think, didn't we get some Freightliners 
that had disc all the way around for a little while? I don't remember a Freightliner having it. Okay, I could have sworn we had a few that had disc all the way around it. So for the longest time, it was such a huge upcharge on everything. It, we kind of waited for in to kind of come down in price. They always sell like the mileage of like the brakes are going to last this much and everything else, and kind of weigh all your options. Is it going to pan out, or are we going to get our value back? Have we seen that? Because I know they were talking on disc brakes that you'd be able to go to life of a truck on one set of pads. No. No, we're seeing some that are failing. Uh, we've had a couple that they just went through. the. It wasn't that they failed uh, per se, but that they went through pads faster and we would have thought that they should have. Didn't so, use a Jake break, right? Well, could have been. <laughs> I, yeah, if you're relying on the, I mean, that's the easiest way to prolong your life of your brakes is use the Jake's a lot more. So the, the trailers, I can almost guarantee you, carrier units, let me guess, wild stab carrier units. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but all the trucks, uh, the APU units, were still sticking with uh, Thermal King on the APU units? Yeah, we did a couple tests. We might have something, uh, just a couple off ones that aren't TK. I know we did some carriers earlier this year. Didn't we do some carriers or later last year? Yeah. So is it still going to be pretty much all 579s and I suppose some three... Uh, Oh, what's the long noses we're buying for the long-term guys? We got a bunch of them. 389s. This next order doesn't really have very many of those in it. It's 579. You'll see the 579 new model. What's different about the new model? Oh, uh, they kind of gave it a facelift. There's some features on them. They're going to have the fan on the crank, and they're going to they move the air box, and they move the radiator fill bottle. They The dash is different instrument cluster dash cluster is gonna be like a digital kind of like the new all the new vehicles and everything else it looks really cool have we got any of them out there yet i would like to go take a look at one of them and see if we got no, some they don't they, they don't, don't have that okay they don't release for a while i've seen pictures of a test truck so they they've been out in on the ground but i don't know if anybody would just be able to see it roll down the road and identify as a 579 but they they have done some testing with them, but uh, as far as we're not going to see them for a while, but we will see those sometime later this year. Ultra loss style too. Yeah, the cab. I mean, they're they're obviously trying to pick up even more aero on them. Trying to ev everyone's focus is fuel mileage. Yeah, fuel mileage. So I mean, we're getting our trucks now are getting eight miles to the gallon. I mean, eight miles to the gallon is awesome. When I was driving, I mean, if a guy could get six, we were happy. You know, I had one truck. If I could get five out of it, I was ecstatic. Now we're getting, we're getting eight pretty consistently. And that's just, you know, my fuel savings, big time. You know, our, I want our trivia question. In fact, I'll give us our trivia question right now for this week is, so Don in the very first episode of the podcast was talking about how drivers were, uh, paid to fix their own flat tires while they're out on the road. So our trivia question for this week is going to be, how much did Don pay the drivers to change their own flat tire while they're out on the road? Now, if you know the answer, you can email me at podcast at deckermail.com or you can call me at 2206. The first person who answers this question correctly will receive a gift card from Darren. That don't answer the question. No, I'm not going to answer the question, but that was when we had the rack on the, the trailer. Oh, this was a long, this was like in the 70s. Is it? Right. Yes, yeah. So you would blow them left and right going down the road, yeah. So they had to change, they had their own jack. They had to do everything, jack them up, take them off, change the tire out, put the tire back on, drive down the road. Yeah. Those were real trucking men back then. Yeah. Just kidding. Anyway, so this weekend I had to do a, I did a run. Normally I've been spoiled with that Cargill. Okay, and I love that Volvo. God, that Volvo is, uh, those D13s, is that what's in those Volvos? Yeah. That's a good motor. I had to go down to Blair, empty, and then load out of Blair going to Eddyville. Well, Eddyville is southeast of Des Moines, okay, down by Tumwa. Well, you, we're 92,000 pounds is what I was grossing with the heavy haul. Mm -hmm. There is, and you got to run two lanes, and there's no good way from Missouri Valley, Iowa to there that's easy. But that motor just chugged along. But I had to, that's the first time in a long time. I put in 12, 14-hour days, but it hasn't been 11 hours straight in the seat for a while. 
uh, my butt was out of trucker shape. Let me just tell you that. You know, so <laughs> I was hurting a little <laughs> bit on Sunday morning. <laughs> so, all right, back to the truck. So, um, I know on the insides, uh, they switched. Uh, I hated the old Peterbilt when they had that shifter down in the uh, the knee knocker, you know, and it was down in the council. Are they going to keep it back up, do you know, on the yep. uh, okay. 12 speed automatics? Still staying with that? Yep. Okay. Cummins. Cummins motors. We'll, we'll have, we'll have, uh, some MX in there also. So yeah, everything. I mean, spec wise, everything's going to be pretty much the same. Now, in the Volvos, are we still going? Have you heard seven sixties? Is that the? I believe that's what most of all the Volvos we get are seven sixties. Mm-hmm. They haven't changed. They're not looking at design change in them, are they at all? No, they just redesigned it. Okay, and the Cummins are four fifties, I believe it is. Yeah. How about any Freightliners we're looking at this upcoming year? Yeah, I think that they're they've always. Uh, yeah, throwing some in. So those we normally Detroit's. Yep. Okay. Fifteens. I don't ever see them show up on the list very often. So they they should are they performing pretty decent? Yeah. I I mean uh, some of the drivers don't particularly care for them, and then you have other drivers that really really want them. That's what they know the best. Uh, the DD fifteen with the D twelve transmission seems to do very well. So if the drivers out there, if for service work or anything like that, what kind of advice can you give them to help them when they're dealing with on-road calls, whether it's getting uh, scheduled for service, any hints, tricks they can use, what should they be doing? Communicate with their DMs. Uh, their DM, we built a sh- shop scheduler. So DMs go in and they schedule in their uh, maintenance. The DMs always have oversight of it, I mean, but the, there's a lot of drivers that are very engaged and they're reaching out as well. I know that the way that they're building it and everything, the DMs have to go into the website, the interest site, and actually add them in. But probably just communicate with your DM. There's a lot of drivers that do a very great job of, of keeping track. I mean, we do put in the card and everything, but they know, they know when they're going to need a service coming up. So WorkHound, okay? Mm-hmm. I know you've seen WorkHound because we're using it for the office staff now. We've been using it for the drivers. And I've got some really interesting lately um, guys were kind of issuing about, okay, how can we go so long on a service now? Um, I mean, we're going, what, 60,000 miles on a uh, A service uh, or a B service? On a B service. B service, okay. Um, so why are we doing it? Why 60,000 miles? When I changed my oil, it was 10,000. Yeah. So up to 75 now. Up to 75. Why? I mean, we don't have any kind of special agreements with any of these guys. Uh, anybody can open up any of the owner's manuals, and that's what they rate. If you uh, if you meet this idle and you're meeting this fuel mileage, that this is where your oil change is. You need to use 1030 CK4 compliant oil. It's all the OEs that are trying to appeal to the fleet world. They, I mean, they... They know what fleets want. Fleets, drivers want to get out and not spend all their time in a shop. And the easiest way to do that is not have them constantly coming in for oil changes. So, yeah, we're going 60,000. And now, our, yes, it's taking longer in the shops because, well, let's say the guy's coming in for just a B service. What is it? You know, it's a seven hours. Let's figure six to eight hours for a B service, right? I'd push eight. eight. Depend, it, 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 the problem is, is that we had a lot of of catch up that we had to do for some other maintenance items. Um, so it did, when guys were coming in, there was a lot of extra PMs to get caught up with. But yeah, if you shoot around that eight hours. You know, most guys, you go to Walmart, you drop the oil, you're in and out of there after you drop it off in 15, 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they, they're they expecting a wall an oil change to only take uh, two hours because they probably go to the speed co and it probably only takes two hours, right? Because mm-hmm. all they're doing is dropping the oil and throwing a filter on it, down the road you go. Why is it taking us eight hours? What do we get into that they don't? Everything. We're changing the APU oil. That's not being done at dealers or at speed codes or TAs or anything. So we're we're changing that. We're looking at the APU hours. Um, we're looking at alternators fail on them. The usage of the APUs is a little bit higher than probably we even thought initially. They kind of give you rough numbers of how much usage is going to be per year. We're above that. So the drivers are using the uh, APUs, which is great. Which is awesome. But it does add on a lot of extra engine hours. So you have these failure 
items that, that you know that an alternator is not going to make it 8,000 hours. So how many hours does it make? Well, TK's done research in that, and they their warranty department comes back. Well, this is how many hours. So we're going through and we're replacing some components based on when they're going to fail to try to be ahead of it so you don't break down over the road. We're doing downloads. We're having to go through and service the DPFs and we're servicing power steering. We're servicing, I mean, we're going through the whole truck front to rear. And I mean, there's just a lot of items. Our PM, we've redone our PM sheet to be even more thorough to make sure that anything we can do internally to keep a driver from having to turn around and leave the shop and break down shortly after. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And you got to look at it this way. So you come in for a B service twice a year compared to where we used to come in, you know, four or five, six times a year. So you got once or two times tw for eight hours compared to six times for four hours or three hours. I mean, you're, it's, it works out the same. Yeah. So they, they just, it's, I know it's a patience thing, you know, they don't want to sit around for eight hours. They get antsy. They want to go, they want to go, they want to go, but there's a re there's a method to the madness is the way I yeah, like to call it. Yeah, definitely. You get, it's a little bit easier to occupy your time for two hours, but eight hours seems like a bit much. We understand it, but at the same time, we need that time with that equipment to make sure that we can do everything we can do to keep you up on the road. What about trailer maintenance? Um, trailers don't see the shops near as much as, as the trucks do because um, they can get stuck out in the system and the drop and hook. How do we, what, what, what are we really doing to try to avoid the, the issues with the trailers or what could a driver do to help? Um, like over the road or yeah. proper pre-trips, post-trips, turn contact and maintenance. Um, we, we find that there's times where shippers or the trailer gets dropped in a lot or something. And there could be damage from just somebody hitting our trailer just while it's sitting there waiting, communicating that stuff out so we can get it repaired up. I mean, we do PMs based on time on trailers just to ensure that that it comes due a couple times a year at least. So it really, I mean, it's just working with the shop and identifying the issues before you take off with the trailer. Uh, if you see another trailer in a lot and you see one of ours, we have some drivers that reach out and it's like, hey, I'm in Tyson and uh, this trailer over here needs this or something like that. We've had some really good guys. I mean, when we did have the Davenport shop, I mean, they used to go to Oscar Meyer and I had one guy, he would, oh God, here's four or five trailers. You know, Dennis Waterson. Dennis is great at that. I mean, yep. he spots something, he'll get it in here. Mike Osborne, you know, they find an issue, they'll get it through there to make sure it gets fixed. Yeah, exactly. So what do you like to do in your spare time? I always ask everybody what they like to do. So if, if uh, vacation spot, where, where's your, where do you like to go on vacation? I never take vacation. Well, why the hell not? Have you ever taken a vacation? Oh uh, yeah, I went to Vegas. It wasn't my favorite spot. I'm not a gambler. Oh uh, yeah, so. I couldn't. Vegas isn't too many people. Yeah, uh, Sturgis like been there. No, well, you still got that orange crotch rocket. Yeah, yeah. You ever ride it anymore? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a I have a maintenance board on my in my garage that I keep track of all of the services on my vehicles, lawnmowers, everything that needs oil, and uh, the Tacoma and the bike. They don't get very many miles on the oil change. The Tacoma, well, you got, why doesn't the Tacoma? Because if it rains or snows, it doesn't come out of the garage. <laughs> <laughs> Typical body, man. You get to spend all this money making it look pretty, but God, it can't come out and use it, right? Well, I also know how much work it is once the salt and everything else eats away. Yeah. You know, just how much time it takes me to polish everything back up. So. Well, I was like Todd Donnelly. So Todd's, you know, he's the one that got me into the Harley deal, you know. So um, Todd won't ride his on gravel. You know, it's it, the rain, you know, springtime. No, we're not taking out me. Pfft, I bought that thing to ride. Okay. It, it, who cares? I've been, I've probably driven 200 miles of gravel on that damn thing in, the, in its lifetime. Cause it just, you got to get there. Motorcycle. I don't care about the, the truck. I do the truck. I don't, I don't want rock chips and everything else. So gravel also chews up tires. I, I just hate gravel. I, uh, I'd well, love to live out in the country, but I would I'd want to find a way to pave a path all the way to my house. Well, you're, you know, your old favorite mechanic, uh, Mike uh, McFarland. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he did that paper route, 
and probably still does it him and his wife did but he used to yeah he did that gravel roads and he i mean he had his own tire changing machine yeah. because i mean it just chewed the living heck out of his tires right afterwards <laughs> yeah. i don't know i would not want to that and how much dust you would get in your house and everything else <laughs> all right meal all right we're gonna go out for a fancy meal where are we going uh, like mcdonald's fancy or? <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> don's taking you out fancy oh no um Peterbilt takes us to that 801 chop house that's always been i don't get out too much so 801 chop house was really good we went there for the imta deal that i went to recently their food's always great went to fletcher's that was really good too uh one of matt gore from uh peterbilt he uh took us there for dinner one night their food was great too well, I know one perk of this job is you do get to get some places because you get to go to Missoula, you get to go to Hammond, you get to go to uh, Birmingham, you get to go to some of the dealers too, right? Uh, Peterbilt and all those places. So at least we get you out to get visit and socialize once in a while, right? Did up until COVID. Up until COVID. COVID has screwed everything Every, up. Everything got screwed up then. But no, yeah, it was uh, always loved seeing the. the terminals and everything else going around seeing the people but it's always cool just to see the areas they always have the spots that you never know about kind of the mom and pop like restaurants and everything else uh, i heard there's a coffee shop or a donut shop out by the missoula terminal it's supposed mm -hmm. to be really good mm -hmm. i haven't been out there yet to go try it but one of these times i hopefully they'll let when this covid thing is over i can go over there and try it so yeah i was talking to jason the other day when he was stopping by to get some breakfast so I want to give you one shout out to your mechanics. I mean, they are the unsung. I mean, we rave about the drivers and we need them and they are the greatest uh, asset we got here. They are, but the mechanics, in my opinion, are number two. They really are. Okay. Because they do all the dirty work to make the other guys do the glory work. And um, I, I, before COVID, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, I was out in the shop. I knew all the mechanics out there and I, I know how hard they work. My son's a mechanic. My other son's going to diesel school to be a mechanic. Now him, whether he makes it or not, sorry, Adam, um, he'll do fine. Um, but uh, they're the unsung heroes. Yeah. What, what do you say? I mean, really, it's thank you for everything they do. They work hard. A lot of them put in a lot of hours. They stay late. We we have a staff that's dedicated to getting drivers back up on the road. And it's not always easy. The diagnostics on everything and some of the repairs. And there's a lot of frustrations that they go through with every day. And they don't probably always hear thank you enough or that you did a good enough job or that uh, you knocked it out of the park. But they do. I guess probably just mainly is thank you for everything you do i agree wholeheartedly so thank you guys keep up the great job and remember keep the shiny side up thank you As always, thank you for listening to Inside the Triangle. Don't forget to subscribe to us on whatever platform you're listening on. That way you will know when the new episodes drop. And remember, submit your questions to podcast at deckermail.com and you could be featured on one of our upcoming episodes. The best way to do this is to create a voice memo on your smartphone, record your question, and email it to podcast at deckermail.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Stay driven to be the best. Thank you.